The Tom Woods Show, episode 1440. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, my away carry-on is everything I look for in a suitcase. It's lightweight, strong. It's got a really smooth glide through the airport. It's got a built-in combination lock a compression system for overpackers like me, and a laundry bag to boot. Get $20 off a suitcase when you go to awaytravel.com slash woods and use promo code woods during checkout. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Scott Horton is with us today. We have the good fortune of having Scott Horton two weeks in a row. He's going to be coming back again next week. But today he's here for a sad occasion, uh, namely the passing of Justin Raimondo, who was the lead columnist at antiwar.com. And he had really been the soul of antiwar.com since its creation all the way back in 1995. He was the author of a couple of important books and of apparently at least 3,000 columns. He had been a radical libertarian for his pretty much his whole life and devoted these past two decades plus specifically to the topic of the empire, war, foreign policy, the national security state, all of that stuff. And he was just tremendous. And to lose him at age 67 is, it's, it's very sad for all of us. I was very, very sad to hear this news. I first met Justin back in 1993 and have followed him ever since. But to help us assess the, the legacy and importance of Justin and, and to talk foreign policy here, because you can't talk Justin Raimondo without talking foreign policy, is who else? Scott Horton who is editorial director at antiwar.com. He is, uh, you'll also find him over at the uh, Libertarian Institute, libertarianinstitute.org. Scotthorton.org is Scott's website. He hosts the Scott Horton Show, where he has recently passed an absolutely astonishing milestone. 5,000 interviews he's done over his career. I, I don't even know what to say about that. There is a small handful of people in the world who make me feel like a lazy bum, and Scott Horton is one of those. Scott also hosts Anti-War Radio on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, and just overall great guy, author of Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, a terrific book. Scott, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. How are you doing? Doing great. Uh, Sorry it has to be under these circumstances uh, with the death of Justin Raimondo, but I did read what you wrote. I mean, you you wrote a nice uh, tribute to him, and you've also written about the future of antiwar.com. My understanding of the origin story, so to speak, of antiwar.com is that it goes back to the mid-1990s, I think to 1995, and my recollection is Justin saying that I, maybe it was Eric, Eric Garris, even in those days, saying, well, I bought the domain antiwar.com. And this is back when like, most people didn't even know what a domain name was. And Justin didn't even understand what the point of this was, but he thought it couldn't hurt to have it. And now, of course, it is an extremely important bit of internet real estate. And so that was right in the middle of the Balkan Wars. So this goes way, way beyond uh, Iraq or where people may think the site started. It was in the middle of the Clinton years, and Justin was relentlessly anti-war. He was writing about the Balkan quagmire in the mid-90s all the way up until he took his last breath. So what can you tell us about Justin? Well, so that's certainly right. So it was, uh, I think, the end of 95 when Eric got the URL for antiwar.com. And as he tells the story, he couldn't get Justin to pay any attention to it. He had the hardest time getting him to switch from a typewriter to a word processor and then trying to tell him that, yeah, no, it's all about this, this internet website now. It took years, I guess, essentially, uh, to convince Justin that uh, you know, this is the thing. So Eric was posting a lot of news on there, and I guess Justin had written a couple of things. But I think it wasn't until Kosovo in 99 when he really finally accepted the power of this website, the ability of the, forget your pamphlets out on the streets of San Francisco. This is what we're doing now. And he started writing what was called the wartime diary every day during the Kosovo war. And that was the real start. And I think that was when That's he began right. to really understand the power of the internet and especially of having that domain name. Yeah, absolutely. So he did that. Uh, I followed antiwar.com off and on, but I I think it, I mean, then I became a regular donor on a monthly basis. And then I would send in bigger donations on a one-time basis because I really, really believed in what they were doing. But I remember when the war in Iraq started in 2003, 
and just having that awful feeling in the pit of my stomach, these SOBs are doing this, and thinking, uh, it was 2003, right? Uh-huh, right. I remember antiwar.com was my go-to place to find out what's really going on. I can't trust these bastards in the media. I can't trust the right-wing media. I mean, Ann Coulter has gotten a lot better than she was then, but she was repeating every piece of propaganda there was leading up to that war. And it was antiwar.com that kept me sane during that period. It was so unbelievably heroic. What's interesting about it, though, Scott, is it's it's run by radical libertarians, yet I'm sure it has a sizable chunk of the audience that's left-wing, and there are plenty of articles that are linked to on left-wing sites. Has it been difficult to manage and balance that? No. I mean, essentially, we're a one-issue site. We're, we're run by libertarians. We are libertarians, but we're not here to sell libertarianism. We're here to sell peace. We're here to oppose the war party and debunk their lies. And so anybody who has that same agenda in mind, uh, we will reprint. Now, if they go too far off track, if something is just way too commie and we need to spend all this money on a Green New Deal or where we won't run that. But if it's no matter who wrote it, if it's sound and focused enough on foreign policy or you know, the corruption inside the military industrial complex or the neocons or whatever, you know, related subject matter, Guantanamo or whatever it is. And the articles sound, then we'll run anybody. And we take real pride in running Pat Buchanan along right next to Daniel Ellsberg and Code Pink and whoever is doing good anti-war work. And so we're very Catholic in that way. We, you know, we'll reprint and we, we, and we like to encourage and link to other people and promote their work when they're doing good stuff. Because essentially, as I say in that piece that I wrote for today, and now what? This is the only thing that matters. All the other, look, I'm a libertarian. I'm good on everything. But I don't care about any of this other stuff. I really don't. It's all about the wars. Right now, as I say in this article today, for one example, the war that's going on in Yemen right now, America's war against Yemen. And this is the lowest level of satanic evil. And this is just absolutely horrific. It's a genocide. It's a deliberate campaign to bomb and starve and destroy a civilian population. And it's quote unquote, us doing it. And so, you know, as Rothbard would say, we can argue all day about how to demunicipalize garbage service as soon as we're done with this. And so that's all that matters to us. And so we're going to keep doing that. And by the way, you know, people mistakenly think that Justin is the one who put that page together, but that was really never true. It's Eric Garris and Jason Ditz who do the news all day, every day. I'm the editor and do all the viewpoints. And Justin was very much our editorial director and our the soul of the site, as you said in your tweet. He was the boss of what we believe in and what we're good on and what we're not <laughs> a lot of the times. Um, but the site isn't going anywhere. Antiwar.com and the project is not over. In fact, Eric told me he got an email from Butler Schaefer saying, so does this mean antiwar.com is over now? Uh, yeah, well, no, why would it? I mean, I mean, Justin was an why important would it? Yeah, piece. Justin didn't do that. He wasn't the one running that site. He never was, you know? But he did have that regular column that was right. very, very hard hitting. Now, by the way, I always thought he had way too many links. in That, that was I mean, me, I understand. sorry. Yeah, but I mean, I get, I get why, because you want to substantiate what you're saying, but every one of those links is an opportunity for somebody to leave antiwar.com. True. I don't want to give them those men, that many opportunities. You know, I want so to keep them on that was my job for like 10 years. I was the one doing the overkill on all those links. And that's oh how my- come I know all this stuff, Tom. It's <laughs> yeah, well, look, CSC that was served my a good purpose. Studies. What do I know? <laughs> yeah. What do I know? That served a very, very important purpose. Um, Justin, maybe you could say a little something about his own uh, background and because he was a, rather a firebrand in the libertarian world. Yeah. I mean, his character is a, he's a very interesting guy. I mean, um, well, I'll talk about from my point of view, when I first found antiwar.com, you know, there's that snarling visage of him in this grainy old photograph with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, looking over his shoulder. You can't even exactly tell what he looks like. And, you know, for people who went back in the libertarian movement, they knew him. He's a guy and he's a good writer and this and that, but I didn't know who he was. To me, you know, the in essentially the dawn of the terror war, I mean, I had read antiwar.com before, but it was really after September 11th. I started reading them all the time and really realized, oh man, this is the guy I got to start paying close attention to here. Um, he was, you know, really kind of a star in a way, like on this, sort of this higher level 
kind of the way I conceived of him. And also he was kind of this mystery. He's this enigma, like this big gay Pat Buchanan loving right winger from San Francisco who you might think, okay, well, he's gay and he's anti-war, so he's some kind of left winger. But so why does he like Pat Buchanan? Well, he likes Pat Buchanan because Pat Buchanan's anti-war. Pat Buchanan's anti-war? Why would Pat Buchanan be anti-war? Oh, because of what a right winger he is. Republic, not empire. It's the only way to conserve the U.S. Constitution is to not turn America into a new Rome that, you know, kills itself and destroys itself from within, which is what happens to empires, you know. And so here's this guy who's this gay rights activist from San Francisco who's anti-war, but not for sort of code pink, left wing, anti-capitalist sort of reasons. He's a pure Rothbardian and and not even pure. He's to the right of Rothbard. He's a Buchananite, essentially. And he's anti-war because of what a crusty old Archie Bunker conservative he was. Um, and he really was. And so that whole thing, you know, it's a mystery. But then when you, you know, solve it and figure it out, then there's a lot of enlightenment in there. You know, it's it's not that being anti-war is a deviation from the rest of his conservatism. It's absolutely part and parcel of it. It's because he's such a, you know, crotchety old coot, essentially, that he just doesn't want to hear any of this BS about why we need to do these things that, in fact, we don't need to do. And so... You know, he was the perfect curmudgeon. And I think he always was from the time he was a very young man. He was essentially a curmudgeon. That was his job, was to sit there with his arms folded, scowling, disbelieving. And he was the best at it. And and honestly, seriously, I mean, I beseech your audience, Tom, was to go back and find Justin's archives and read them from the times of September 11th through 2002, 2003, and four and five and see the history of how all of this unfolded through Justin's eyes and through his writing. It's just incredible, man. And there's so many articles, you know, I, I linked to a bunch of them, uh, you know, a lot of my favorites in that piece that I wrote today. Uh, but there's so much good stuff there. And, you know, I was reminded when I was going back reading some of that stuff in the links, man, he was good. You know, and especially, actually, if you only read Justin in the last few years, he wasn't as good. But there was a time where, and I don't just mean because, oh, boo-hoo, I disagree with him somewhat about Trump and this and that, but just he got a little older and a little lazier. But man, in the George W. Bush years, these are, he was the most important writer in America. Forget it. Everybody else was in last place. There's no comparison. I want to say a quick thing about his book that he wrote, Reclaiming the American Right, mm -hmm. that I read a long time ago that really put meat on the bones of what Rothbard was saying about what the prevailing views of foreign policy were on what we might call the right wing. I mean, who even knows what these terms mean at that point? But before you had National Review, and he really does go through and show that there are very important people who in no way can be classified as left wing, who were anti-New Deal, who were also anti-intervention in general, and who were anti-intervention even into the early years of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And then this gets all swept away. That's a really, really great study and, and book. And, and I think Buchanan may even, in a later edition, may have written either the foreword or something, but there's definitely some trace of Pat in there. Yeah. So that's one thing I want to make sure people know about. Uh, but but another thing you were talking about, well, let me read for, for the folks a little something of what you wrote about him. Um, I'm going to link to your couple of pieces at tomwoods.com slash 1439. But you say, and this is quite a compliment, there is no question in my mind that in the Bush years especially, Justin was the most important writer in America. I'm far from the only one who was impatiently waiting around for midnight to hit refresh and devour the latest behind-the-headlines piece three times a week. And then you go on to say that Justin – yeah, Justin gets the credit for teaching the masses, including myself, the truth about that mysterious and troublesome sect, the neoconservatives, in the George W. Bush years, and then on and on from there. I know that there are going to be some folks listening who actually don't know Justin Raimondo. I even had somebody, if you can believe it, on my email list, my email list, write to me after I sent out a piece about Justin saying, you know, you really should let us know more about these obscure sites like antiwar.com. I didn't even know it existed. Now, I've talked about antiwar.com quite a few times in many contexts 
but somehow he had missed all of them. So he, so he didn't know about anti-war, much less Justin. There will be people who have not heard of Justin, and they're going to, after we say all these things about him, they're going to say, I'd like to read one or two of his better columns. Would you be able to link me to a couple of your favorites so I can put them on the show notes page? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, the only problem is I'm going to overkill you with, there's yeah, just Yeah, right, so I, know, much I know, I know, I know, I know. Give me no more than five, okay, if you if you possibly can. I'll, I do I'll want pick out a to- good five favorites for you, absolutely, Tom. Good, good, yeah. good, good. All right. So, um, all right. So, what else? Uh, what else should we say about Justin? He's a great writer. Well, he, let me elaborate he, on the neocon thing there. Um, yeah, the neocon thing. Very boy, boy was he anti neocon. Yeah. Well, so here's the deal. At the turn of the century, Republicans are Republicans. What? They're the country club guys. They're the oil men. They're the bankers. They're the CFR guys. The Wall Street guys. The big business ownership essentially are the American right. So, what the hell is a neocon? And I remember, you know, in the 1990s, it was kind of puzzling to me that the Weekly Standard always had Saddam Hussein on the cover. And that Bill Kristol, he's this weird guy. He doesn't really look like a Republican. And that's not an ethnic thing or whatever, because he's Ashkenazi. I'm not saying that. But it's just, he can't grow any whiskers on his chin. He doesn't look like a kind of right-wing tough guy warmonger should look, right? He's sort of a pencil neck geek. And yet he never shuts up about how we have to attack Iraq. And I never really understood exactly what was all going on with that until I started reading Justin. And now there are a lot of people besides Justin who knew about the neocons. Jim Loeb, I think, is probably the world's greatest expert on them. People can find his archive. I link to Jim Loeb's archives at IPS News there, going back 30 years on these guys. There are plenty of people who knew about them, had tangled with them. Your friend Paul Gottfried, of course, is the world's greatest expert on the neoconservatives. Murray Rothbard, of course, uh, going back into the decades. But the American people never knew about this. It, you know, Republicans are Republican. What's the difference between James Baker and anybody else? I don't know. And Justin came and said, look, there's this very particular sect of Republicans who are all ex-leftists or at least ex-Democrats trained by ex-Trotskyites mostly. And there's two or three generations of them. And these are the guys who are the world's greatest hawks inside the Republican Party and in the George W. Bush years, most importantly, completely ensconced in the National Security Council, the president and the vice president's office, the State Department and the Pentagon. And they were the ones who lied us into war. They were the ones who allied with Ahmed Chalabi to come up with all the fake stories of the weapons of mass destruction. They were the ones who set up the office of special plans in the Pentagon to pick through the CIA's trash and come up with better lies to scare your mom into letting them have that war. And Justin had their number. And Justin was the one who I give credit to him for popularizing the term neocon, making that a thing. And in fact, now people overuse it. They abuse it. And now it just means any hawk, like Sean Hannity's a neocon or John Bolton's a neocon. No, they're not. Those guys are just right-wing hawks. That's all. John Bolton, for example, is a lifelong Barry Goldwater right-wing nationalist. Um, And he is a conservative. He isn't any kind of centrist Jeb Bush type. He's a right winger nationalist and never was a commie. So he's very close to the neocons and his, you know, policy agenda comes essentially straight from them. But he's not exactly one of them. It's a biographical designation that just applies to less than 100 men, really. And Justin really helped to explain that. Of course, I'd be neglectful to not mention their ties to the Likud party. I mean, they were essentially partisans, not just of Likud, but especially of the Benjamin Netanyahu faction of the Likud party, which was more hell bent on war with Iraq, where Sharon preferred to attack Iran uh, at the time. But uh, these were the guys who lied us into war and their Zionism had a huge role to play in their motive for doing so. And that's not to say the entire war came from them because of course, uh, George Bush, Donald Rumsfeld, and Dick Cheney are not, they're Zionists, but they're uh, certainly not ex-communist leftist intellectuals. And it was their war. They were the bosses. George W. Bush was the one who made the decisions. There's no way to, to diffuse that responsibility away from him. But at the same time, there's no way he could have done it without them. All right, let's take a quick break. Last time I was in New York, I saw what some of you know is my favorite play of all time, the play that goes wrong. 
Now, again, for you longtime listeners, what is the indispensable item you know I brought with me when I went up to New York? Answer my away carry-on, because that thing makes me the king of the airport. Now, I've told you about the features of this thing. The four 360-degree spinner wheels make it glide so beautifully. It's got a beautiful compression system inside, so you can really pack a whole lot in there. You've got a TSA-approved combination lock built into the top. But then I also mentioned that it's made with premium German polycarbonate, which is unrivaled in strength and impact resistance. Well, the other day, I can't tell you what it was because I can't guarantee that you'll have the same results I did. But let's just say I accidentally did something extremely traumatic to my away carry-on. And then in my horror, when I went to go look at it, doggone it, the thing still works after I just put it through the ringer. Free shipping on any away order within the lower 48 states. And for $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash woods and use promo code woods during checkout. That's $20 off a suitcase when you visit awaytravel.com slash woods and use promo code woods during checkout. Scott, I was very pleasantly surprised to see, I don't know if you saw this, I know you don't do Twitter really, but Thomas Massey retweeted a Jeff Dice tribute to Justin. Oh, and that's nice. I saw Justin Amash did too, actually uh, said something nice. Oh, did he really? Mm -hmm. So that was like two levels of radicalism. It was a Jeff Dice tribute to Justin. Right. Got retweeted. <laughs> so that that was especially nice, nice to see. Um, he was one of those people, Justin, whose knowledge of this stuff rivaled yours. And there are not that many people we can say that of in the libertarian world. And he, I mean, he was just writing constantly. And he... Because there's so much to say about American foreign policy because they never stop. There's so much to be writing about. Just tell us about his coverage of the wars, and, and, and we can just confine ourselves to 2001 to the present. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, that's very kind of you to say. I'd like to think that my knowledge rivaled his. Um, certainly, it does not surpass his. Um, but, you know, as I said, I learned a lot of this stuff from him in the first place and for doing the research for all those links for his articles for all those years. So uh, he was certainly uh, my teacher and not the other way around when it comes to all that. But no, nah, listen, I mean, this is the thing about it is he wrote three days a week and he had something to say about everything. And this is sort of my advantage, right, in, in doing my show, too, is this. I never quit this whole time. I've been covering it day in and day out this whole time. Well, that was the same thing for him. So essentially nothing got past him. Every important thing that you need to know about the Iraq war, every important development in the month of October 2004, some all important decisions were made about the future of the Iraqi constitution and this and that. He was on it at the moment, telling you exactly what it meant all the way through and destroying the war party and their lies and their excuses all the way through. And so if you go through all of our terror wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Syria, Iraq War II and three, if you, you know, the war against the Islamic State is Iraq War III, all of Syria, and even the consequences of the Libya wars, they spread into the Sahel and to Mali and Chad and Niger and all into northern and western Africa there. He's on it. He's on every bit of it and debunked essentially every lie the whole time. And as I say in the article today, the real big ones and the larger narratives, but also all the little ones too. Somebody truck bombed Lebanese Prime Minister Rafik Hariri to death in 2005. And immediately the war party blamed Hezbollah and Syria. And Justin went, that is such a lie. Are you kidding me? They say that it happened like this, but we know that it happened like that. And they say that Hezbollah did it, but look at their incentives to not do it. And meanwhile, it turns out that actually it was an Al-Qaeda guy, as even the Israelis had admitted when they weren't trumpeting the propaganda that it was the Shia. It was a Sunni radical who had done it, a bin Ladenite type. And he was right about that. And there's a million of them like that, too. And, you know, I should mention, he was under investigation by the FBI as a national security threat, they used FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and the, the FISC, F-I-S-C, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, to usurp, to go around the Fourth Amendment. And this is the only time that it's proven that they used the national security architecture like this specifically against an American journalist. And the ACLU was suing on their behalf. And what did it? It was because antiwar.com posted a PDF file of an FBI suspect list for the 9-11 attack 
that included a guy named Dominic Souter, who was an Israeli intelligence officer living in New Jersey and running the Israeli moving company that the High Fivers all worked for, the Israeli uh, fans of the 9-11 attack from that morning who were arrested, you know, laughing and joking about the attack. And so it was an FBI suspect list and it had already leaked. It, by the way, it was already public because they'd given it to a bunch of banks and an Italian bank, I think, had made it public. And antiwar.com got it and posted it. And then the FBI pretended to believe that maybe antiwar.com was an agent of a foreign power. Yeah. And launched an investigation, absolutely criminal investigation, not a criminal investigation, but a criminal yeah. investigation of Eric and Justin. And um, as Eric wrote in the obituary there, that uh, one of the last things that Justin got to see with his conscious eyes was the live feed from the courtroom when uh, the judge smacked down the FBI or the federal prosecutor for claiming that the judge had and the courts had no right to determine how the FBI keeps evidence on innocent people and as a continuing part of that fight in their in their court fight there. And so one last little win for him on the way out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that when that hit. I just, it's just unbelievable. You're anti-war, and it's just like the neocons. They cannot imagine that you could I, – I, you know what? I'm not sure that I believe that, that they actually think you're an agent of a foreign I – mean, they, I mean, maybe some of them are that dense. But the rest of them figure, let's just try whatever smear – because apparently the American public, there's a sliver of them who will just buy whatever smear you throw at somebody. Yeah. Well, Especially you know, part if of it, it involves something like this. Part of it was actually a mistake where – on September 12th, I think, Antiwar.com got a bunch of death threats. And Eric kind of panicked. And he, he would fess up. I think he's fessed up to this publicly. He's, he's, you know, it's part of the story. It's okay. But he kind of panicked and he called the FBI and said that people are threatening to kill us. And this, they at least claim it was their contractor who looked at it. And the contractor claimed at least to think that Eric was threatening them and was threatening to blow up the FBI and, and completely misunderstood the message. So possibly that was just a pretext, but possibly he thought, what the hell, this guy's sending us threats, you know, that, you know, I don't know if it was worded funny or what, I don't think it was, but you know, and of course, Eric is like, duh, hits himself in the forehead. He shouldn't have called the FBI about some silly empty threats back then, but he was kind of panicked and everybody was kind of panicked on September 12th. Okay. He was one of them. Uh, and so that was sort of part of the basis of it, but then they went wild with it. And again, pretended to think that it was possible that somehow antiwar.com was some foreign front group when of course, you know, Eric had been under investigation by the FBI for the first time in the very early seventies in like 72, when he helped organize an anti-war uh, rally when he was like a 15 year old communist, <laughs> you know? Um, so they knew who he was. There's no mystery. I said he was kind of mysterious. Well, all you had to do is Google the guy and there's no question who Eric Garris and Justin Raimondo are. Uh, they have a very lengthy public record and we know exactly what their motivations are and everything else too. Uh, they're Rothbardians, man. They're not agents of a foreign power. And so for them to use the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act against antiwar.com in that way, even if it was based partially on a mistake, nah, not the rest of it. You know, they're being very cynical there, I think. And hey, I mean, after all, what's the law? The law isn't anything unless people have the honor to insist that it's obeyed. But if the FISA judge is willing to let the FBI do whatever they want, then there is no law, is there? There's just state power and the will of men. Tell me about antiwar.com going into the future. Obviously, somebody is going to write that lead column now. How's, what's it going to look like? What's antiwar.com going to look like? Pr pretty much the same, but with some difference. Yeah. Well, listen, first of all, it's going to remain the same. I mean, Eric Garris and Jason Ditz, they are the workhorses of antiwar.com. They are the ones who put that page together of everything that's important in the world and in order of importance and what it all really means. And Jason Ditz, I mean, I don't know what we'd do without him, man. Everything you read by him, you'll see how he always says something like, which is funny because last week they were saying this. You know, you don't get that anywhere. 
you know, and it's Jason's writings that are the highest traffic stuff on the site. And that whole front page, it's not just aggregation. There's a lot of care that goes in to uh, cultivating all of the day's news for you there. And I'm the viewpoints editor, and I'm going to keep reading everything in the world for all those opinion pieces for you um, and all of that as well. And then, you know, unfortunately, we've had a dearth of regular columnists lately. Kelly Vlahos is over at TAC and Phil Giraldi is over at uns.com. And uh, Alan Bach, of course, tragically died a few years ago. Sheldon is still alive and kicking and healthy and wonderful, but I think he's just so burnt out on writing. He's been a regular columnist for antiwar.com for a few years now, but I think he's just over it. So we haven't gotten anything out of him in a little while here. Which, you know what, you write the same article 10,000 times about stop killing people. It gets kind of tedious. Um, <laughs> but, um, and Danny Sherson, who up until very recently was still an active duty major in the, or Lieutenant Colonel, I think he's a major, in the U.S. Army. He just finally got out of the Army. Uh, he is really our main regular columnist that we have right now. And I love him. I mean, the guy is absolutely great. And so knowledgeable, but he's a leftist, which is great. And we're happy to have him as a regular columnist. You don't have to be a libertarian to be a regular columnist, but he can't be our main columnist because at the core, we're here to represent the Rothbardian take. And so I'm afraid to say, because I really don't think that this is necessarily the right thing, Tom, but it looks like it falls to me to be the head writer at antiwar.com. Because I really just don't know who else is going to do it. Um, and Well, the issue is, Scott, do you have the time? No. I mean, I don't. <laughs> In fact, um, yeah, you know, I'm yeah. trying to get this book written. My, the book I was supposed to write with you in the first place about a relatively short take on each of the terror wars. And that's going to take me at least through, you know, the fall if I'm lucky to get done. I'm going to try to write a column on a somewhat regular basis. But... You know, I have to say that, you know, we're Justin, just like Moon of Alabama, Bernard over at Moon of Alabama, he turns out an article every day, essentially, on like up to date current events. This is what happened this morning, and this is what it really means. And I just don't think I'm up to that. I always feel like I'm playing catch up. I'm trying to aggregate all of these other guys who got everything right today and figure out what it is that they got right for me because I just, I don't think I can yeah, do so it. Yeah, so maybe you, yeah, you don't write that kind of column. If, if you can't do it, uh, there, yeah, there are a lot of people I really admire and I say, I don't know how they do that, so I don't try. I do what I can do. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I don't know. Um, maybe it's sort of like with the show. I'm sort of catching up on the week. And so maybe rather than really cracking the case the way Justin used to do. Maybe I can settle for, and hopefully my readers will settle for my best take on what Bernard wrote this week, you know, that I thought was important and, and the other things, you know, I don't know. I'm not as good as Justin. I'm just not. He's a natural born talented writer in a way that I'm not. And maybe I got a flaw that I just can't let any old thing go and move on to the new story. I always feel like I'm still keeping up with the last thing, but maybe I can try to make a change about that. But I can never really replace him, uh, and I wouldn't try to. But, you know, somebody has to be in that spot, at least, as the head columnist of the site and setting the tone for who we are and what we're about. Are you going to change here. the name of the column? Oh, well, Would I don't it be have called a name behind for my the headlines? column. Okay. Oh, behind the headlines? No, I mean, that's his. That's, that's his, yeah. Yeah, no, that's never been the name of my column. I'll have something different. I'll call it, God dang it, Bobby. Although, no, nah, I guess people won't like that. Um, I don't know. I'll have okay. to, I, I was thinking about that. I have no idea what to call it. but okay. um, And I have no idea how successful I'll be at turning out a regular column, honestly. But I'm going to try because I really don't know who else to put in that spot. I'm like uh, Dick Cheney choosing the vice president. Well, I guess it's me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, you know, you're, you're probably too young to remember this, even though you're only a few years younger than I am. But, uh, you know, in the 1970s, Peter Gabriel leaves Genesis and they audition a ton of people to replace him, a ton of people. And they finally realize we got Phil freaking Collins playing the drums for us. How about he sing? 
You know, oh yeah, how about that guy? So likewise, we got Scott Horton here. <laughs> you know, maybe we could use Scott Horton. But at the same time, I realize I'm it's working a time on commitment. that Phil Collins hairline right now. So <laughs> yeah, me too. Me and you both. <laughs> That's right. But it's a time commitment. So when you're, I want people, I want people to know you're coming back on next week. We're going to talk about something entirely different. And in that conversation, we are going to talk about your forthcoming book. And I want people to help you out with it because it's. It's really, really important. And everybody knows that Scott Horton's book on this stuff is going to be the best thing you can possibly read. And there are ways you can help to make it happen. I mean, this guy runs himself ragged working so darn hard. We all want to do something to ease that burden on you. And so we're going to do that next week. In the meantime, people should check out tomwoods.com slash 1440 where we'll link to what Scott's been writing the uh, past couple of days about antiwar.com and Justin. We'll have some columns by Justin. We'll have Justin's Reclaiming the American Right book that I mentioned. All that stuff will be there, tomwoods.com slash 1439. And of course, links to Scott. I mean, you got to visit Scott. People want to support you as I do. I support not only antiwar.com, did I, I donate a lot of money to antiwar.com, but I support Scott Horton directly because what he's doing, even though Scott and I are friends, in fact, we spent 35 minutes before this conversation talking about entirely personal issues. And then we finally pressed record and and went. So even though we're friends, you would think it might be kind of awkward to send him money every month. Not really. PayPal does it automatically. I don't even notice that it's happening. So if if you feel that way, don't worry about it. Just send Scott the money. Um, What should people do to support you? Um, Well, scotthorton.org slash donate or libertarianinstitute.org slash support, I think it is. Um, is my little old institute there with Sheldon Richmond. Before you let me go, that we have to at least mention so that it goes in your show notes and that kind of thing. Justin wrote the only single definitive biography of Murray Newton Rothbard. And it's called Enemy of the State, The Life of Murray N. Rothbard. And it is absolutely perfect. So every Rothbardian in your audience has got to read that thing, man. It's really, it's everything you needed. I'm jotting that down. Of course, we should include that as well. I remember reading that. Yeah. I think I, I think I flew through it in an afternoon. I couldn't not read it. Oh yeah, it's just wonderful. It's just perfect. All right, so we'll definitely put that. But yeah. but but suppose people. I mean, look. Um, I know this is meant as a tribute to Justin, but you are now. I know we don't want to say stepping into his shoes because that's that's difficult. But you are taking on a major new responsibility, and we're all cheering you on, and we want to support you. And how can we do that? All right. Well, there's antiwar.com slash donate, scotthorton.org slash whatever. I don't know. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> slash terrible support this. slash donate, something or another at antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org. Um, and by the way, anybody who donates, uh, who signs up on Patreon or PayPal to support uh, at $5 a month to me or to the Libertarian Institute, you get keys to the Reddit room. You inspired this. I just hate Facebook too much. So I don't have a Facebook group, but I have a Reddit group slash Scott Horton show. And anybody who signs up for five bucks a month gets keys to that. There's about 180 of us in there now. And it's a nice little group. I really like it. It's a nice relief from Twitter. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, real conversation. And some really good people in there. Yeah. So All right, it's scotthorton.org slash donate. I found it. Yeah. And buy my book. It's Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And there's an audiobook version. If anybody could stand and listen to nine hours of me talking about something, a lot of people seem to like it. So, All right. So definitely do that. I, I don't want to overwhelm people with links. Yeah. Uh, so we'll put them all at tomwoods.com slash 1440, including a link to your book. All right, Scott, we'll talk again next week. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Tom. All right, folks, that is going to do it for another episode. Your homework assignment for tonight is to go get my ebook. AOC is wrong, the upside down world of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Yes, I know you kind of know the arguments against what she's saying, but really, if you were cornered, would you really be able to defend the free market on health care? Or would you really be able to make a good argument against so-called free college? I mean, these things sound pretty plausible, I think, to the average person. Or what about the Green New Deal? Or shouldn't we tax the rich more? All that stuff and more is, let's say, dismantled carefully and lovingly in this free ebook costs you nothing. All you got to do is go over to aocisrong.com and download your copy. So go do that. I will be checking your work tomorrow. So make sure and do your homework assignment tonight. We'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. 
Check them out at podsworth.com.